Welcome to the Jamal Bryant Podcast. Let's be clear. Uh, today is going to be a riveting, engaging, and a compelling conversation that you don't want to miss. We are right in the heartbeat of transformation in America. There's a lot at stake. And there's a lot on the line. Today, I've got a guest who is a dear friend. We've got so much in common and so much that is not in common. We're both preachers. We're both fathers. We're both public figures. And that's probably the end of our commonality. Outside of that, our political ideology is a little bit different, but our heart for God beats the same. I'm glad to have uh, an amazing friend of now 20 years, Pastor Mark Burns. Uh, he is uh, probably the most outspoken and the most visible uh, supporter of uh, former President Donald Trump, who is a black preacher. Uh, he's come in today from South Carolina to sit with me. Uh, and I am so grateful. Pastor Burns, welcome. Happy to be here, Dr. Bryant. Listen, we've come through many dangers, tolls, and snares. Yes, we have. All right, <laughs> let, let, let's just jump right in. I got to ask you uh, just to set the template for today. That is your fault that I'm here today. <laughs> yes, I'm grateful. Years. I take all of the blame, <laughs> and in an hour, I'm going to take all the credit. <laughs> I want you to tell me in your eyes, your mind, uh, I'm going to make you a historian today. Okay. So today, tell me your perspective on January 6th. January 6th. Well, uh, Dr. Bryant, you know, I was there. I did not. I was actually one of the speakers that was I there. I did not know I that. I was actually listed as the first 50 people that the January 6th committee listed on their investigative list because I gave a speech that said, give me liberty or give me death. And because of that, they added my name to be one of the first 50, 40, excuse me, first 40 to be investigated uh, because of my participation. So, yes, yes, my brother, I was there. So you're cleared. I'm cleared. Okay. Because, right. it, it, because <laughs> <All right. laughs> ain't nobody busting through the door yes. today. No okay. FBI showing up today. No, I'm yes. cleared uh, because, again, I was there. I was at ground zero. I yes. was in the hall. I was in the, uh, the hotel with. Uh, Roger Stone, uh, the same hotel. They call our room the war room. All yep. of this fictitious things. Um, so any account that I give you is a firsthand account. Right. I was there when they escorted us out the room in the golf cart. My chief of staff was, uh, my sister along was with me when they put us in the golf cart and they ushered us out of the city because apparently there was some chaos that was taking place. Now, keep in mind, the Willard Hotel was the headquartered hotel where myself, Rudy Giuliani, Roger Stone, Steve Bannon, all of the characters that they have listed as the uh, quote unquote conspirators yeah. of this so-called uh, um, uh, uh, insurrection. Yes. Uh, and so you don't call it an insurrection. Well, I think no, it's not insurrection. What it would you call it? I think it was a a group of rally people who. Uh, felt that their voices were unheard. Matter of fact, yes. Dr. King said that the 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 language of the unheard yes. is rioting. So you think it's a riot? I do believe that what happened was unconstitutional. I one hundred percent. Well, you spoke believe out what was unconstitutional? The the storming of the Capitol. You I, thought it was unconstitutional. One hundred percent. Wonderful. Yeah, of course. So we, listen, let's shake hands. This may be a different conversation than I thought. But who would? But who yes. would think that going against again? You're a historian. Yes. I'm a historian. Uh, the only time that the Capitol was sacked was against our enemies, the British. Yes. And they burnt it down to the ground. And so it is not uh, uh, an ideal uh, uh, desire that we take uh, authority by any physical violence whatsoever. What I don't would you think say then to those right uh, Congress people who were cowering? Uh, in the auditorium saying that they were fearful for their lives of representatives that were calling their loved ones, saying they weren't sure whether they were going to make it. Uh, you had people who were standing in the uh, Speaker of the House's chair, a uh, police officer that uh, found himself uh, gasping out of oxygen. Uh, you called me a couple of years ago and uh, you said to me, uh, Jamal, this is, uh, this is uh, your hour your moment, your call, you need to be leave it, leading the Black Lives Matter moment. Yeah. That's what you said to me. Yeah. Tell me how you think that the discourse and history would have been different if this same outcry of those who are oppressed 
was Black Lives Matter at the Capitol. What do you think would have been different? Well, I think we've already seen an example of it uh, in the great state of Tennessee when they sacked the Capitol Hall. And we had uh, in protest of two uh, black state legislators who were uh, disbanded, uh, who were later reinstalled into the Capitol. I think we've already seen it, my brother. I think that they... Did the same thing. I think you also seen it with the LGBT community when they also sacked or led an insurrection uh, against the will of the of the enforcement of the state capitol. Nothing drastic happened. Yeah. I think now let me be clear. I'm not one of those black men who think that racism doesn't exist in America. And I'm not one of those black men. I'm very I'm very uh, 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 on record to declare that there is still a two-tier justice system. We're looking at it right now, the life of Donald Trump, and I've said it a thousand times. For the first time, he knows what it feels like to be a black man in America because what has happened to him with this two-tier justice system, uh, because he is Donald Trump, it's yes. been happening to black men for 400 years in the, America. The only difference, Mark, is that with 86 indictments, a black man wouldn't be able to run for dog catcher. Absolutely. 100% uh, agree. Yeah, can you imagine? There's a third tier. Yes, we're can not, you we're imagine? Not fooled, we're not foolish to believe. Can that. you imagine Barack Obama having to pay a woman scores of eighty-three million dollars? Mm -hmm. uh, he would be completely obliterated from the political system, uh, and so for him to say that he identifies with a black man may be a little well, bit first of a stretch. Of all, no, I'm saying that. because he, yes, but yeah. even you realize Tim Scott said uh, just the other day that America doesn't even care about the indictments. They don't even care that he's got to pay. This is just our our fearless leader. Mm -hmm. I don't know if a black man would be able to boast that same test. <laughs> without question, without a doubt. I mean, again, I'm not saying that he is a black man. Yes. I'm saying that he understands what it feels like regarding the two-tier justice system amongst black men. And that is true. I do believe that that's the case. Now, I'm not saying that he has the same, uh, because again, if it was you and I in that same boat, we would, or really not just you and I, Yes. Anybody else, Anybody. Uh, that if they were in his shoes would not be still the number one contender for the Republican nomination and by all accounts beat Joe Biden in a one on one head race, most likely will be the 47th president of the United States of America, according to the latest polls that exist. Uh, if the elections were held today. Yeah, well, it's not today. We got a long road to November. <laughs> we, we got a very long road to November. Okay. Uh, just very recently, Tim Scott uh, came out of the presidential race and... Uh, uh, pledged his undying love to uh, Donald Trump to made uh, a lot of people in the black community cringe. Sure. Uh, but the reality is uh, that I have to admit, uh, even with uh, the likes of uh, Rick Ross, uh, famed entrepreneur, rapper, businessman, mm -hmm. yourself, Tim Scott, there's a growing number of black men, Snoop Dogg, Snoop Dogg, right. Dogg mm -hmm. who are supporting uh, Donald Trump, I want you to unpack for me because I can't figure it out. Sure. Explain to me what is the allure for black men to push, support, and even vote for Donald Trump? Well, I mean, we see it in the polls, uh, Dr. Bryan. Um, again, this, number one, the two-tier injustice system that is happening to this man unjustly, uh, black men are identifying it in high numbers. They see in themselves a version of themselves in Donald Trump and how the just injustice system is working for a billionaire who was the former president of the United States of America still having to jump through these, how the system can be used against somebody simply because you don't like them for whatever reason, whether it be the color of their skin or you just don't like them because they're Donald J. Trump. Um, number two, um, black men are seeing that uh, Donald Trump's economical policies are significant for uh, because we are the providers of our families. I right. mean, we should be uh, the providers of our families and black men, entrepreneurs, black businesses are seeing that the policies of President, uh, President um, Donald Trump um, is effective and more conducive to what we're trying to do within our own lives. And so you're seeing a large fluctuation, a growing, let me say a growing fluctuation of, of, of black men supporting Donald Trump. You're saying a growing fluctuation of, of African-American men saying, you know what, I'm gonna give Donald Trump a try because the Biden administration and the Democratic policies are not affecting my lifestyle. They're not affecting my bottom line. 
And so when you see uh, President Trump, when he was in office, signing the criminal justice reform bill, when you see, which was a bipartisan bill, when you see President Trump uh, uh, giving money back to the HBCUs, creating a permanent office within uh, the White House, a permanent position, a liaison position within uh, the White House so that HBCUs can have a direct connect with the White House that did not exist before. When you see uh, the opportunity zones that are simply giving tax credit to businesses like yourself and myself to go and type impoverished communities, a lot of those communities are black communities, our communities, and giving businesses great tax credits to create jobs within those communities. Black men are saying, you know what? I, I, I'm giving this guy a try because the old, old uh, ploy of the Democratic Party, again, I was a Democrat uh, for my whole life until yeah. eight years ago. And, uh, and again, there was a time where the Democratic Party really spoke to the African-American community. It has been hijacked by the LGBT community. And that's a whole other matter because that's a conversation that I'm very baffled of. We as the believers and the Christians and the pastors and the leaders of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, uh, already know that it is illegal spiritually to be a homosexual, but yet we embrace it as though uh, 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 that it is legal. God never created anything or God never created anyone to be anything that he already deemed to be unlawful. He never did. Pete Buttigieg said that God, my creator, made me this way. But yet it has been hijacked by the African, excuse me, the uh, civil rights movement have been hijacked by the uh, 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 the LGBTQ community. So for me, you're seeing black men saying, I'm tired of being demasculized, uh, 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 be, uh, uh, to be uh, uh, emasculated, uh, emasculated yeah. uh, by this movement. No, we're not queer. No, we're not. Uh, we are strong black men. Yes, we have come up through the ages, and they're identifying that with a Donald Trump. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how uh, James Baldwin says to be black and conscious, you have to have some bit of rage in you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I saw uh, here in Georgia some uh, peeling away of black male support, not in terms of a Republican, uh, but when uh, Stacey Abrams was running for governor here. Mm -hmm. uh, part and parcel of why she didn't get elected uh, was uh, black men didn't get in line uh, to support her. And she was a Democrat. Mm -hmm. uh, and they said that we just couldn't see it. But a lot of black men are moving away from the political system all the way around. They're sure. saying, my vote doesn't matter. I, I don't count. I'm not being heard. Mm -hmm. Going into November 24, let's uh, be nonpartisan for 30 mm -hmm. seconds. Sure. Being nonpartisan for 30 seconds, you're not Republican, I'm not Democrat. Why should black men even bother voting? Well, I think it's because of the black men that died in 1865 for the right that we have to vote. The fact that there many black men were hung simply for voting. Mm -hmm. And of course, those early voters were voting Republican because the Republican Party was founded with the ideal to eliminate the America's original sin, which is slavery. Mm -hmm. And it was founded uh, with leaders like uh, Representative Stevens and and, and, and so therefore fought on the legislative floor in 1864, 1865, excuse me, in 1863, so that we can have a right to be human in America. Right. And the countless of black men and the countless of black women that were, that the strange fruits that was hanging from the ceiling, that was hanging from the trees uh, throughout the South of America and throughout the, uh, the, 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 the Northern parts of America, those people fought so that we have a right to even vote. And until we get more leaders who will stop fighting for emotionalism and start fighting for policies that are beneficial to my livelihood, livelihood your, the votes won't count. Yeah. Reverend Sharpton said this to me a long time ago, and he said, Pastor Burns, ignore the haters that come against you. He said, because they're, that we need us on the other side. Until we get both sides, Republicans and Democrats, fighting for our uh, our uh, our uh, needs as a people, we will never really ever make it to the promised land. He yeah. said, "Listen, we may be on two different sides, but never forget we're on the same team, because our mindset should be to connect our interests. Right. What is what is in our interests? That there are policies that you you stand." For right. I completely disagree. I think they're unbiblical. 
I think that we as the preachers of the body of Christ should never, ever, ever support any legislation that is contrary to what God already said. Yes. If God deemed it to be unlawful, then it should be unlawful regardless of our position or stage. And that's why I'm a, that's why I am a, a conservative. Yeah. But, um, but the, the same gospel, Mark, also says, consider the poor. Yes. Uh, be mindful of the widows. Yes. Remember of the orphans. Absolutely. Uh, do those who are the least of these. Yes. Uh, Representative uh, Senator Bernie Sanders says that his concern uh, with the Trump policies is that they only seem to benefit uh, the upper echelon, the oligarchs, so the 1%, the tax breaks and tax mm -hmm. credits are mainly skewed to those who are wealthy and who are affluent. I'll say this even before you respond, is that the Republican agenda seems to be focused on the wealthy, the Democratic agenda seems to be on the middle class, but neither as men of God, neither party seems to have a pathway or a blueprint for the poor. Mm -hmm. And I think part of our responsibility as a responsibility as being Christians is saying, who will remember the poor? Uh, and the least of these is part of our responsibility. So if we're going to be on both sides of sure. the aisle, mm -hmm. you're going to be on the Republican side, I'm on, on the Democratic side. Yeah. What then will you say uh, to uh, President Trump if he is reelected and put back in place? When he's reelected? No, well, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna see if you're a false prophet in November <laughs> or a real one. I'm, <laughs> I'll bring you back on well, that day of after. Were false prophets yeah, when yeah, you thought Hillary Clinton but, was about to be the first listen, woman president. Of the United I, States I, I, listen, America. I fall on the sword. <laughs> I didn't see it coming. I was in shock and all. You did I, call me. I, yes, I, I did. I you did. <laughs> what, what would you say if, to him? Because the, the reality is, uh, Pastor Mark, mm -hmm. the poor are not uh, benefiting from the opportunity zones. Uh, they are really the uh, casualties of gentrification at a high level. Uh, it's a great investment opportunity for those who have access to capital sure. to invest in it. Uh, but what would you say to the president in terms of carving out an initiative for the poor, for the working class, and for blue-collar workers? Well, I think that these initiatives has already been put in place, but the problem is, is my people perish for lack of knowledge. I think that we're fighting too much on whether or not Donald Trump is racist or not and not looking at policies that have already been laid out for uh, not just our community, but for any poor person. Um, but again, a lot of these legislations and, and, and policies were laid out specifically for uh, the black what community. What is the policy? One of them is the 8A program. The 8A program. I'm pretty sure you're familiar with the yes. 8A program. Tell, and tell why the people we what be it is. Spending more time focusing on how black businesses, how this was created specifically from Richard Nixon's administration, led by Dr. Bob Brown. I'm sure you know who Dr. Yes. Bob Brown is. Yes. He's a mentor of mine and how he helped led the spearhead of, uh, again, Richard Nixon, President Nixon doesn't get really hardly no credit for what he's done. Uh, for opportunities within the black community. Watergate overshadows his presidency, but he and Dr. Bob Brown uh, out of North Carolina spearheaded. Dr. Bob Brown marched with Dr. King. Dr. Bob Brown was the very first individual to speak with Nelson Mandela to even begin the negotiations of his release. He was the first person that dropped in books inside South Africa that was beginning to speak against apartheid uh, regime there. And yet he was the spearhead to Richard Nixon's uh, presidency, the 8A. 8A. A, 8 Alpha is a, essentially a policy led by the, uh, 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 by, uh, the Department of, uh, of Commerce that states uh, America has to do business with black and minority businesses. Have to. 10% of what, the American, what America spends has to be spent with minority businesses. It was designed specifically uh, to increase capital within black-owned businesses. Right. That's why we have Jet Magazine. Mm. That's why we have Ebony Magazine. The second richest black man in America is by the name of Dave Stewart. He is the, without question, the most successful 8A uh, recipient from Richard right. Nixon. Al well, Hollingsworth Mark, Mark, also is. Let me the, finish the statement. Yes. Al Hollingsworth uh, is why we have Pringles cans. Right. Uh, uh, and so the 8A program exists. We spend very few time, few moments talking about how we as a people to receive this type of money. You know how much money black people receive under uh, President uh, uh, Barack Obama's presidency? Do you know how much money that was set out, carved out supposedly for black communities? 
And how much that's received? Less than 1%. Less than 1% out of $78 billion spent less than 1% went to black-owned businesses. Why? Because we spend way too much time worrying about if Donald Trump is racist or not whether or not he was part of the redlining in the 70s and whether whether or not he is against Black Lives Matter and whether or not, you know, don't give me no Black Lives Matter sticker. Give me access to capital. Right. Yeah, well, two things. One is that you have to, uh, I'm going based off of what you said, the redlining is not based off of former President Trump, uh, but initiated by his father mm -hmm. uh, in New York, who refused to let returning veterans uh, live in his properties. Uh, so we cannot dismiss that that issue. Number two, uh, Pastor Burns, is that you've got to look in the place that uh, this A8 uh, initiative did not go in effect, and we're seeing the dismantling of DEI happening even right now. A whole lot of pledges were made uh, after George Floyd, and uh, most of those companies have reneged on it. Black businesses are finding themselves faltering because they're not having access to capital. So as a consequence, Ebony and Jet are now sold. Mm -hmm. As a consequence, BET is now mm -hmm. in the hands of uh, uh, white owners. And so right. we've got that same small group uh, in the top echelon, but those who are down at the bottom are still uh, yearning to breathe free. Because as, it's a lack of communication. And brother. it's not because of people believing that Trump is racist. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, let's is take his own base of green. Right, and this is all under Biden administration too. Remember, he's been president for four years. I think this is a reason why, Dr. Bryant, you're seeing a large flux of black men leaving the, Rep uh, the Democratic Party. Again, I'm not here to argue Democrat versus Republican because to be honest with you, I think they both are in league together. I think the reality of it is people ask me, the number one question people ask me all over the, uh, all over the country amongst black, white people, why is it that black people still vote Democrat in such large numbers when they see that the policies of the Democratic Party are not benefiting uh, the average black family? We are still at the bottom of the totem pole in America concerning economic growth. We are still at the bottom of home ownership uh, in America. We are still at the bottom yeah. of access to capital. Why is that happening? And still, we vote in mass the Democratic Party. Well, because, number one, the Democratic Party spends millions of dollars perpetuating the lie that Republicans are racist. I understand that because I thought Republicans were racist, too. When I first came conscious of being political, uh, pl uh, the political entities in America, Bob Doe was running for president. He was a Democrat, uh, Republican nominee. Bill Clinton was the, uh, excuse me, Bill Clinton was a Democrat nominee. Bob Doe was a Republican nominee. And we all believed Bob Doe was racist. And we was happy that Bill Clinton won because he went on City Hall and he played the saxophone and said he smoked a little weed, but it never inhaled, right? Uh, that was the concept of politics. Republicans are racist. Democrats are for black people. Now, fast forward, the fact is Democrats spend billions of dollars perpetuating that lie of how Republicans will consistently put black people back in chains. That's all you got to say in America. And black people say, yes, we're not voting Repub Republican. Now, the onside to that is Republicans don't spend any money speaking against the lie. Yeah, well, They spend no money to say that's not true. We don't want that to happen. Here are the policies that are designed to help the average black man, like the uh, the fact that in application in America today, President Trump signed it into law that you don't have to, to remove the, uh, the, the inmate uh, uh, checkbox on every application so that when you apply for an application, you no longer have to check on your application that you was an inmate. He removed that. People don't talk about that. It doesn't get... Uh, and that has affected black men and black people in America when trying to get a job after having been incarcerated. Well, a lot would argue that he did that because he's had the most indicted cabinet and staff members of any U.S. president in history, that that was a part to uh, really cover his friends. But historically, Pastor Burns. Black people have been Republicans. Yes. Booker T. Washington was a Republican. Yes. Frederick Douglass was a Republican. W.E.B. Du Bois was a Republican. Yes. There was not a shift to the Democratic Party until the Civil Rights era. Mm -hmm. And in the Civil Rights era, they said, OK, let's look at a different prism and a different opportunity. And so we've been on both sides of the aisle. Yes. Transparently, black people resonate with the morals of the Republican Party, yes. but the policies of the Democratic Party. And so weird is that uh, black people are 
really spiritually, they are more conservative. Uh, yes. They believe in a lot of uh, the Republican values. traditional values, yes. mm -hmm. uh, but it is the policies uh, that are more community enriched and empowered uh, that uh, black people have been drawn to. So historically, the Republicans have had an edge uh, because black people, even to this day, are credit. Uh, Abraham Lincoln with uh, Emancipation Proclamation yes. say that this is the party that freed black people. Yes. Uh, and so this is uh, not uh, Donald Trump's uh, virgin voyage. He has had a dance with us before. Uh, but uh, as we are diasporic people, uh, we can't ignore, Pastor Burns, that uh, President Trump called Africa in large measure as whole countries. Uh, uh, and so those who have come out of the womb of Africa saying, how, how do you look at it in that way when it has the most amount of resources, has the greatest capacity for trade, uh, offers the mount, uh, most amount in terms of human capital and oil and gold uh, and rubber, and never extend any apology to it. So let me just say this, um, Dr. Bryant, and again, um, you are, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, uh, one of the great, uh, greater influences uh, in my life. I've said to you privately and I've said to you publicly, and I'm even here sitting in this chair eight years later, uh, since 2015, and you had actual hand to do that. We'll talk about that later. Yeah. For everybody that's yeah. watching this broadcast yeah. that want to start, you know, hating on Pastor Mark Burns, <laughs> this guy is the reason why I'm still sitting in this chair eight years later. But um, now the reason why, Dr. Bryant, um, is because lies or mis uh, miscommunications like what you just gave are still perpetuated as truth. President Trump never said as whole countries. I... Uh, is, is, is recorded... Pastor Burns? No, 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 no. Yes, no, no it's no. recorded. No, I was in the com I was part of the conversation. I wasn't in the room, but how it's been portrayed. No, no, I, no, no. I'm talking about there's a audio recording of it that you can pull up today. Those of you who are listening to this podcast, uh, we are deputizing you as research <laughs> analysts uh, to help us very quickly. But go ahead. Yeah, well, uh, yes. again, I think that as long as those conversations, and to be honest with you, if we are giving money to any country or anyone that we have done uh, over the years, yes. America, Democrats and Republicans, uh, to assist them in the aid of those countries, and they're taking that money, those resources, and is not getting down to the people, there is a problem with the leadership of those organizations. And those people should be held accountable. I agree. But I said nothing about aid. What I said was trade. What I said was resources. And a lot of people- when Money they, is resources. Yes. When they look at Africa, they always look at it as a welfare nation. When they are really trying to pull themselves out of the World Bank, out of IMF, uh, to stand on its own. Mm -hmm. And so when I was talking about it in terms of being an ally- I wasn't talking about a UNICEF, let's dig a well and adopt children. Mm -hmm. I'm dealing with how do we bring those diamonds and those gold out of there. Let me ask you this question. Yes, Why is it that black people are leaving the Democratic Party today? Yeah. Why? Yeah, I think uh, black people are leave, leaving the whole political system. This election, I believe, and I want to be wrong, mm -hmm. will be the lowest turnout of black people in recent recorded history. Since uh, 1992, the strongest, Pastor Bar Bar uh, Burns, since 1992, the strongest voting bloc in America is black women. Mm -hmm. Black women is the most consistent voting bloc in America since 1992. Yes. If you extract them out of the entire demographic, then all of the results are different. I think that there is a dizzying that the polls, yes, show presently uh, Trump uh, beating Biden, but the polls in an overwhelming way for uh, Gen Z, uh, for Alpha, and for millennials are saying, we wish there were two different candidates altogether. Mm -hmm. Throw the whole thing away. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that both parties have a responsibility uh, not to do plastic surgery, but to do CPR uh, to inject oxygen back in. And I think both of us are going to have a damnable time trying to get people rallied to go to the polls mm -hmm. uh, because people are saying, we're the geriatric part. We seeing two old men fight it out in the cane uh, that this is the oldest leadership that America has ever seen. Any revolution that has ever happened in the world 
has always happened with the hand of young people. Mm -hmm. And when young people, black, white, and brown, yeah. are saying they're disengaged from the system, uh, it gives me great pause. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree with you that until we as a people come together and to the part, again, let me just say this, until we as a people um, come together, and that was actually one of the initiatives that I was doing, uh, Dr. Bryant, and I even said this to you years ago because I said this should have been you, uh, leading this, uh, um, this uh, when I was first invited to come to speak with Donald Trump back in 2015, and was invited. Uh, Dr. Dara Scott invited me to the room. And oh yes, how's Pastor Scott? He's doing well. He's doing well. Very strong. Still very, very strong. Please give him my regards, Pastor Scott. If you're listening, I, I still love you, sir. I will. He's very strong and very uh, uh, doing very well, um, and so. Uh, I had the conversation with you that very day that um, this should be you. You should be in this room. You should be leading this 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 initiative, this charge. And you said I need to stay right where I am, and that um, and that you need to you're you're in communication with those people. They have accepted you. You need to stay right where you are. Um, and I took that to heart. And here am I, eight, nine years later, still on this battlefield. Um, I think until we decide to stop looking at emotionalism, and I think we start looking at policy and echoing policies, um, Democrat or Republican, again, I think they're both in league together. I've been yeah. very vocal to saying that. I support the Republican Party. I support the, the President Trump Republican Party, so to speak. I don't necessarily report, support the Republican Party uh, the, the the traditional Republican Party, because they don't support me. They don't support what we're doing. If that was the case, um, we'd be spending hundreds of millions of dollars speaking to the black community. That yeah. does not happen within the Republican Party. Um, you will see donorship rising amongst black policies and pushing black voices like mine, and it does not happen within the own party. I think uh, we have to carve out our own house. And I don't complain about people not supporting me within the Republican Party because I'm God's child. And because I I believe what I preach, uh, I'm not affected by it. South Carolina uh, is going to find itself really as the epicenter in this electoral process. Mm -hmm. uh, in the last election cycle, uh, Georgia had the spotlight uh, between uh, Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnock. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the very first time in American history a black and a Jewish man is uh, elected to Senate uh, at the same time. I was thinking on my way to uh, talk to you today that uh, South Carolina is going to be the epicenter mm -hmm. of this election cycle for black people. In the last election cycle, it was uh, Reverend Raphael Warnock against uh, Herschel Walker, and we were able to uh, flip the state. Uh, but I think in this presidential cycle uh, between you and uh, Tim Scott, uh, Jim Clyburn, uh, and yourself, uh, that you will probably be the most seen and the most heard black men between here and uh, November. Mm -hmm. uh, given the historical uh, imprint of uh, South Carolina, uh, no matter where it is that you find yourself on the political aisle spectrum, I think it's significant a place where black men could get hung for registering to vote, that you all are now the most influential people in this nation uh, that will really impact this election. So as a South Carolinian, uh, what does that make you feel? Well, uh, you know, again, um, my goal, number one and job, uh, Dr. Bryan, is to echo the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. I'm first a kingdom citizen. Yeah. And every opportunity I get, uh, whatever stage I'm on. Um, the, of course, as you said, uh, the South Carolina primary is coming up here yeah. in a couple of days. Uh, we're getting started. I'm booked throughout the whole entire month. Um, I'll be on all these rallies and fundraisers and small events, large events, echoing the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ and also the pushing the policies of President Donald Trump, which he's expected to win by large numbers. And this, it, it should have been better for Nikki Haley, the former governor of South Carolina, to drop out in New Hampshire and then to come to her own state and to be embarrassed uh, by the state in which she's from and the state that she was former governor of. Um, it's a heavy burden. It's, it's not, it's lonely. 
Yeah. I mean, I think you can, I, really any leader of any significance understands the, the blessing and pain, uh, the blessing and curse of being a, 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 a vocal public person. Um, and uh, my prayer is that um, it's not about voting, so to speak. It's about empowerment, empowering yeah. our people and empowering poor people. Yes, poor people is a big thing. The Bible is very clear yeah. about that. But I think that um, as long as we're fighting each other and fighting personalities and not focusing and spending just as much time empowering through information, yeah. we'll never really get to the promised land. But it is a heavy weight. Uh, all eyes are, will be on South Carolina. And, is um, Tim Scott going to be the vice president? I think he is. You do? <laughs> I think he is. I think there's. It, it's not an accident that he just got engaged. Yes. Uh, and 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 now. Yes. Uh, and and I can and I can can't go too much into that, but I know that you answer you answer you all heard it here first. <laughs> Y'all got it on record first, right here. <laughs> Thank you for giving me uh, an exclusive. I I cannot let you get back to South Carolina without us dealing with the elephant in the room. Okay. Uh, you've got to talk to me in terms of uh, where you see um, the whole conflict in Israel going. Yes. Well, again, I think uh, the Bible is very clear that uh, Israel is God's people and that anyone that blesses Israel will be blessed. Anyone that curses Israel will be cursed. Uh, I, however, do believe that just like any organization or any institution, there could be characters that use it for their own benefit. I am prayerful, in prayerful, for the innocent people that are in the Gaza Strip. Those babies, those uh, uh, you know, mothers, or those uh, innocent old people that have been killed in the middle of this conflict. It's a very sad situation. I think that it is our sp spiritual obligation to support Israel. Um, I think that we need to destroy Hamas and wipe them off the face of the planet. I think it's cowardly of Hamas, the terrorist organization, to hide behind and use the innocent children, the Christians in Palestine, um, uh, to hide behind them as human shields. Yes. Uh, and and so therefore, um, I still believe that we need to support Israel against the terrorist attacks of Hamas um, and wipe them off the face of the planet. Yeah, the, the Bible says, uh, come, let us reason together. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hope uh, you uh, and I, whoever is the president, uh, would be able to uh, come as men of faith for a discussion to be able to take place. Uh, up to this tick of the watch, Pastor, 33. Thousand people have been killed, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that there's got to be an opportunity for us to carve out a, a way forward in terms of uh, what peace looks like mm -hmm. uh, for them to be able to peaceably exist. I believe that the hostages should be freed. I think that uh, Hamas needs to be subdued, mm -hmm. uh, but I also think that the genocide that is unraveling right before our eyes uh, has got to come to a screeching halt. I, I want to uh, ask you uh, this, having uh, uh, nothing to do with uh, politics uh, because there are those who would champion that there should be a separation between church and state. Let's put politics aside for one moment. Uh, and I want to ask you, uh, what do you see as the future of the church in America? Well, to be honest with you, Dr. Bryan, I really, uh, the future of the church is in my eyes, very bleak and dismal. I think that Right now, the church is extremely silent and mum on policies and procedures or legislations that are contrary to the word of God. Mm -hmm. And I think that because you're having more pastors who are compromising their, uh, their stance on, on what the word of God says about a particular policy, uh, for instance, abortion is one, um, life is, we know it is, is important. And I think that when you look at the gay community and the LGBTQ community, I think that um, the Bible makes it very clear that it is an abomination. Um, and I think that we in the church are speaking too much about the love of God and not enough about repentance to God. Mm. The love of God is that gay community be delivered and healed. Pete Buttigieg again said that uh, uh, his creator created him this way, but God didn't create things 
uh, um, to be unlawful um, and against his word. I believe in demons, Dr. Bryan. I believe that demons are very real. I believe they walk the earth today. And we have very- But you're, you're not saying that people are LGBTQ are filled with demons. That's not what you're saying. Well, I believe that sin is twisted. Yes. I believe without a shadow of a doubt that sin twists the heart of man. Yes. Um, and I believe that there are some that are not just part of the gay community. I believe any sin, whether you're an alcoholic, whether you are a liar, whether you are uh, um, a thief, whether you're a murderer, you have these evil thoughts in your minds and your heart and you act out upon them. I think all of them. See, we're isolating the LGBT community, but God hates sin. Yes. Period. But when you look at all have sinned by and, thought, and called, uh, yes. by word, and by deed. Uh, that, but it is our desire to repent. Yes. And we're talking about a repentant part. I have no issue whatsoever, a, a, a gay person who struggles with their homosexual thoughts because to me it's no different from a heterosexual person struggling with their heterosexual sexual thoughts yes um i think that they're the same I, my problem is politically that l unlawful deed sin mm -hmm. has been interjected into the public school systems have been pushed upon policies yes um, and it's taken the power out of the hands of conservatives and uh, conservative parents who believe that marriage is only between man and woman and that their innocent children yeah, you, should not be intertwined into this, into, into that mindset. But you believe all have sinned. All have sinned you and fallen short of the glory of God. And all of us should and repent. And I also believe that we all should repent. Yes. Yeah, so let yes. me ask you why you feel that President Trump has not repented to any of these women he has offended and has been found guilty by court of assaulting and unresponsible behavior, but to none of them he has apologized. As one of his spiritual advisors and leaders, what do you say to him about repentance? Well, I can simply say this, um, that President Trump in those particular regards have not admitted to any of those deeds, right? Right. And I can simply say this, uh, that um, we live in a society, and again, I'm not, uh, I don't know enough about the court cases. I don't know anything about the evidence. I'm not a legal advisor. I can you only know that he has to pay $83 million. I can simply say this, that I do know that the court, uh, I knew the courts uh, uh, um, um, found him guilty to pay yes. that $86 million. Yes. But I also know that those same courts are the same people that are set, have been set President Trump up from almost day one, the moment that he announced the run for president uh, to create a two-tier injustice system specifically targeting him. Um, and hence why the rise of black men are supporting President Trump because they see themselves within themselves. I believe that we are, we're, we're talking about, and your question was, Dr. Bryant, yes. the state of the church. Yes. Right? Not the state of Donald Trump. We're talking but about But you're talking leaders. about repentance and sin, and that part of our call is to call people into repentance. And that includes and, the gay community. And this also calls presidents and people who are in authority and to whom much is given. the LGBT community. You are Nathan. And you, you are, are Nathan. Jonathan. You are a prophet and you are to the king. To speak to the gay Absolutely. community and not apologize to and them. And you are called you are to speak to, to the president of the United States. You are called to tell them that the and wages you of sin are is called death and the gift of God is to eternal men life. And that you we are have a called, responsibility Dr. to Bryan, honor to tell them both man that they need and to turn female. Their hearts Absolutely. And repent from, and repent from every their sinner. actions. Every For, sinner. Every sinner. Every one of them. Not apologize to them. Every sinner. Not negotiate with them. Whether you are a president, a senator. Love them, yes. A stripper, a teacher. You have to love them. Or you work at yes. the ice cream factory. The, yes. You so we agree all of sin. Absolutely. And everybody who sins Martin needs Brothers to repent. Chief Center. Uh, well, I'm your vice president. <laughs> We're in it together. Yes. I'm grateful that we've had this conversation. I am too, Dr. I'm Brian. the richer for it. I am and too. you are coming back I the week so. after the election. <laughs> Win, lose, or draw. You are coming back in this chair because we're going to have to follow up and see what happens. I happened. would be so honored to do that. No, I I'm would. grateful for your time. Thank, Thank you for you, being brother. a friend over the years, yes. for being a brother, and for being authentic to who you are and for what you believe. And may the grace of God cover you. Let's be clear. I need a nap. <laughs> <laughs> this is Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryan. I'm so grateful that you joined us. You got to stay tuned and watch every episode. It's only going to get better from here. One of the best conversations I've had in a long time. Woo!
You don't want to miss anything that happens on the Jamal Bryant podcast. Let's be clear. In order to see all of the footage, all of the behind the scenes, everything, you got to go right now to jamalbryant.org. You don't want to miss it. 